So what we got right now is we got a couple live people who are going to get up in front of you and give a quick recount of Python 2.7, the good parts, the bad parts, what it's up there. It's up to them. It's their choice. I've not pre-screened these in any way. And we'll go through uh, Cameron, uh, Jeff, myself, and then we have four videos from the community that I will share with you all. And if anyone after that wants to give up and give a last couple words to Python 2.7, uh, they will be allowed to. And then we will uh, commence with the uh, merrymaking and the wake having of the Python 2.7 celebration of life. We do have the Exploding Kittens game. So you all should have received your expansion pack for said game. And we will be uh, partaking of that, if you like, uh, afterwards. So there's no official presentations, no uh, boring, mundane stuff. But I will ask Cameron to come up and kick us off with our Python 2.7 Remembrance. Oh, you got the, the microphone? Oh, here it is. No, 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 up here, up here. <laughs> I mean, you guys could kind of come up here and give a Cameron duet. Well, I mean, what do you think? I think that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> um, so uh, there's not apparently a, currently a bartender available, so I don't have my props. Um, oh. But you can imagine me here with a <clears throat> malt liquor <laughs> and pouring one out while telling you all that... Were they going to give you like a bucket to pour it into? Oh, I hadn't figured that out. I had it, I had it figured out when I thought we were across the street. Because um, I know those bartenders. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was, I was going to do that while telling you all uh, that Python 2.7 support uh, ends on uh, December 31st at midnight. Um, or January 1st at midnight or something like that. And after that... Um, the prices for what it takes for me to upgrade your code to work on Python 3 triples. So between now... <laughs> is this a fire sale? Is this, this is a this fire is? sale, That's yeah. what this is? Okay. Um, so between now and uh, let's say December 1st, you can probably get me at a normal rate. After that, it'll just go up exponentially per day. And I, I don't know how math works, so you can probably lie to me what the, that actually works out to be. But yeah. Because <laughs> um, Python... Python 2.7 sucks compared to Python 3. You've had 11 years. 11. As of um, December 3rd, I believe, you'll have had 11 years to upgrade your code. So it, this is on you now. That's all I got. That's all you got? All right. Awesome. Let's give uh, Cameron a big round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Laquia, please, please join us in honoring Python 2.7's life. Got my notes here. As any good man should. So today we're celebrating sort of the end of life, and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to talk for a moment about the beginning? And so I want you all to cast your minds back, some of you younger folks who don't have gray beards to stroke, um, may be able to remember back long ago, back in the days of the dot-com boom, or actually the dot-com bust. Some of these people weren't born then. Yeah, that's something I'm not sure I wanted to be reminded of. <laughs> um, You're welcome. Oh, thanks. It was kind of a dark and stormy time. A lot of people in tech were kind of worried. We'd just come off, you know, Y2K, nothing happened. Woohoo! You're welcome, by the way. Um, the dot-com boom was turning into the dot-com bust. A lot of people were kind of worried, you know, uh, all the tech stocks were down by 80, 90 percent. People were going out of business, all that good stuff. You know, good old time. Uh, not like we've ever experienced that recently, right? So, Back in that day, right about October or so, uh, there was an announcement made that there was a new era in Python. The future had arrived. Python 2.0. Yes, that's right. We had moved on from Python 1, and we were now in 2 land. Some of the notes, and I'm going to have to apologize in advance because my phone has a ridiculous uh, screen, uh, screen uh, saver timer. Some of the interesting notes about this were um, some changes to the um, 
the distribution model, that some changes to the way that Python was developed. Uh, up to this point, Guido had basically been working on Python as sort of a moonlighting thing, like his main job kind of tolerated him working on it. Um, it was right about this same time that a new entity was formed, something that they thought might have a little bit of a history. You may have heard of it. It's called the Python Software Foundation. Ooh. Yeah, that was right about that time. Um, there were, this was formed to uh, act as sort of the caretaker for Python. Uh, there had been a number of issues with licensing and so on, and one of the things they fixed was to just sort of get rid of all of that for a while. It was actually considered like dangerous or not legal or something like that to write GPL Python code, believe it or not. Uh, and they fixed that with Python 2.0. Um, other things that changed. Um, they moved on to um, put all of their development into something called SourceForge. How many people remember SourceForge? Yeah, yeah, okay, good, good. So this was an amazing development that allowed them to increase the core team. Up to that point, it had only been like single digits. They were now thinking they might be able to have a core team as large as 20. Can you believe it? <laughs> we are like in the big time now. Infinity. In absolutely crazy. And then they also said, you know what, we want to make sure that decision making in the Python community is going to be, you know, a little more democratic. It's not all just Guido telling us all what to do, which we were kind of happy with all that time. But uh, we figured, ah, we'll just kind of open it up. And so we came up with this thing called the Python Enhancement Proposal Process, otherwise known as PEP. If you've ever heard of PEPs, some of you probably have cursed when uh, you've been running something called PEP with PEP8 in the name, and you've been like, oh, crap, my code doesn't look right. Well, now you know where this all got started. So, And then um, here, let me pull up my little list here. Um, and then, of course, the code itself. One of the things that was uh, interesting about Python 2 is that um, Largely, Python 1.5 and earlier code ran pretty well on Python 2 without any changes. And of course, as we all know, that's a, uh, a, um, a precedent that they decided not to keep when they did the Python 2 to 3 conversion. So uh, it may be surprise you to learn that generally speaking, most people didn't really care. It's like, oh, Python 1, Python 2, you can run it and probably just works. Uh, some of the interesting bits that changed. Um, the biggest, the most important, the, the best feature about Python 2. This is the feature, by the way, when they designed it, they knew at the time that they got it right the first time. Yes, that's right. Unicode support landed <laughs> in Python 2.0. And of course, as we know- Go they home, got... Python, you're drunk. <laughs> yes. So this is, of course, the point at which, you know, they looked at it and they said, hey, we've got this right. This is going to be, you, we're never going to need to change the way we handle Unicode. We've solved this problem. So some other features you might be interested in. Some of you might um, be real big fans of list comprehensions. Any list comprehension, folks? Yeah. That was a Python 2.0 feature. Did not exist in Python 1.5. I remember looking at it and going, whoa, that's kind of strange. Okay, um, I'm, having, I'm gonna have to learn how to do this because this looks pretty good. Um, some other things that were changed. Um, sorry, I'm not as uh, organized as I perhaps should be. So how many of you have used like, so you know how you can increment um, variables and, and uh, tack onto strings by using things like plus equals or minus equals or whatever? That was a Python 2.0 feature, brand new for Python 2.0. If any of you have done stuff with KW args and KW args, does everyone, do people know what those are, how those work? This is the thing where you can have variable numbers of um, uh, parameters to a function, and you can even have keyword parameters and stuff, and you don't have to specify it ahead of a time. You can have people pass as many parameters as they want, and you just gather it all into either a list or a dictionary, and you can refer to them that way. That feature landed in Python 2.0. So. so I just thought I'd go over real quick some of the interesting features and some of the things, some of which I think worked out really well, some of which may not have worked out so well. Unicode. 
And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Big round of applause. All right. All right, my turn. So what's funny is I managed to corner Jeff beforehand and get a cliff notes of what he was going to talk about. And it was exactly my talk. And so, yeah. yep, worked out perfectly. I was like, that one's done. Uh, we'll do another talk. <laughs> oh, thank God. Okay. Oh, you know what? I got the whole nighttime thing going on here. Nightlight off. Ah, oh, there. Thank goodness. No one else to, like, endure that. So I wanted to give my final, you know, thoughts and remembrances of Python 2. So I'm going to completely scrap my talk, uh, even though the slides are here, and just leave it pretty much at this one, the in the beginning, because I think this was important. Uh, I joined the Python community back in year 2000. So if you know your timelines of Python, so Python 1 was released in 1991, while Guido was working at an uh, educational institution in the Netherlands. 1995, this is where this gets tricky and important. Actually, Jeff kind of touched on this with the GPL license compatibility issues. He moved to CNR, CNRI, which is the Corporation for National Research Incentives, Initiatives. At that point, they claimed they owned all the intellectual property of Python. So Python 1.6 was released September 5th, 2000. Guido promptly left CNRI and less than, almost less than a month later, Python 2.0 was released. The license changed. And the 1.6 release had very little changes over 1.5, other than stripping out a bunch of junk. And basically, it was supposed to be Python 2, but was not really Python 2. They were saving that for the CNRI move. So Python 2.0, the fixed to the license was added, amongst all the other features that Jeff has uh, all told us about. But I thought that was interesting that there was a non-GPL friendly version of Python that I was actually unaware of. And I came from the Python 1.5 land. So I don't know if Jeff, or you go back all the way that far? Are you making me look old now? I work, early work, Python 1.5. Okay, thank goodness. And I'm not the oldest person in the room, just close. Uh, so I, I started doing work with Zope, the Z word. And that is how I got introduced into the Python community. Uh, my first Python community event I ever went to, I am wearing the shirt from it today, which is the PyCon from 2004 in Washington, DC. There were 254 people present at that PyCon. Uh, those of you who've been to PyCon today will know there are many, many more. But I attribute its success to Python 2, like moving out of the dark ages into Python 2, those new features that Jeff talked about, and then I obviously came for initially for the language, but I certainly stayed for the, the community. Uh, these people have been some of the best people I've ever met, uh, some of the smartest people I've ever met, and Python 2 is the reason that I think all of this really flourished. So if you don't know, Python 2 was released in October 15th of the year 2000, uh, in our year of our Lord. So Python gives us, oops, there we go gave us a lot to be thankful for. I think most of all is going to be the community. So I know this pep process, augmented assignment, list comprehension. See, I told you this is exactly like Jeff's talk. Uh, except this one. Who uses this? And do you know why we have a new print statement? It's because of this mess. OK, Jeff's nodding his head. I know he knows what I'm talking about. The print function in Python 3, oh, as of 2, 6, or better, includes a file argument, which is print to the file instead of printing to the standard out. And that's what this is. So if you care about consistency in one least bit, you'll understand now better why we have a new print function and why that had to be done. And a line had to be drawn at Python 3 for this to happen. Uh, there were other standard library additions, uh, notably HTTP 1.1 support in HTTPLib. Does anyone use HTTPLib? Nope. I didn't think so. And then so I, <laughs> and so then the obsolete modules, uh, there are none. Python, one, Python 2 obsoleted nothing. So like Jeff said, from going from Python 1.5 to Python 2, there was really very little 
backward incompatibility issues. And I claim that Python 2 actually probably never happened. It was really an extension of Python 1 that just kind of kept developing on the same thing. The only reason for Python 2 to actually happen was the license change to make sure that CNRI couldn't take all the credit and we could make it actually GPL friendly for the community. Uh, that's what I've got for my Python 2 uh, send off. Uh, again, I, the community is what's really made it for me an important part of being around everyone. And that's why I grew the community here in Indianapolis. We are almost 13 years uh, along. We started in 2007, so in the heydays of Python 2.7. But Python 3 was there, um, but not well used yet. Now, I do have some special treats for you guys, uh, you all. Sorry. I, I'm trying to wean myself off this guy's word. It just kills me. But I'm admitting to my problems. But for everyone in the room, I do have some special treats. I did contact my community, my people, my Python people. So to kick this off, I have got... You may recognize this person. Does everybody know this guy? So Kenneth Wright sent us a nice little note to IndiePy specifically about Python 2 uh, and its uh, end of life. So let's, uh, let's listen to what Kenneth has to say for us. Hello, my name is Kenneth Wrights, and I'd just like to say that Python 2.7 is on its way out. On <laughs> January right. 1st, it will no longer be a supported language by the Python Software Foundation or by the Python community. If you're still using it, uh, I really recommend that you stop. Uh, however, it, there's no technical reason that you need to stop. Uh, it is practically a social reason. Unfortunately, we live in a society where there are exploits and vulnerabilities that get exposed by languages every day, and those exploits will be ignored uh, for the Python 2.7 branch, and it's sad to see it go. It was a great language. It continues to be a great language and it will always have a special place in my heart. Thank you. All right, so for those of you who don't know, Kenneth is the author of the request library, amongst many other things. Uh, so next up, some of you may know. All right, so. Whoop, whoop, hello, let me uh, put this on the other screen. Here we go. Uh, so this is Chad Whitaker. He is the author of the Aspen Web Framework. Who in the rooms used Aspen before? Yeah? He's also written lots of other libraries along the way. A uh, good friend of ours uh, in the Python community. Uh, so Chad kind of gave us some parting right. words. So my name's Chad, and I first started hanging out in the Python community in like 2002. Really, that was. My entrance into Python was through Zope and through Plone, the content management system Plone. And I went to Plone events and then eventually discovered that, hey, there was this great language underneath this really <clears throat> uh, amazing content management system. And the language is Python. He and says so that, he says that with Python love. Meetups and Python um, the, to the conference, to PyCon. Um, and ended up publishing some libraries. So the, the theme with the libraries that I publish is that they're all a little too far outside the box, I think, to really become um, well-established. So I made a web framework called Aspen. Uh, another one was Postgres.py, which was a database library that was sort of uh, kind of bucking the ORM trend, I guess, and saying SQL is a great language. What if we just wrote SQL? Uh, instead of, you know, rewriting SQL inside of Python. Yeah, so I made these libraries, published these libraries, had a lot of fun with that. Did a project called GitTip, which turned into Gratapay, which was about funding open source software. But for this recollection, I guess what, we're celebrating Python 2.7, the Python 2 line. I want to share one story from PyCon. This would have been... 20, it was Santa Clara, I'm pretty sure. I don't remember when that was. 2012-ish, 2014, somewhere in there. Do you remember why the lucky stiff from the Ruby community? So, I don't remember if we ever found out his real name or not, uh, but he was this really um, kind of reclusive artist type that was key to driving Ruby's popularity. 
and then kind of his fame got the better of him and he disappeared from the scene uh, and you know sort of foretend uh, from the Ruby community um, at PyCon one year I saw somebody that just was the spitting image of why the lucky stiff and I was like oh my gosh really so the, and this was like a year or two after why I had disappeared from the Ruby community and, and then I see in line for coffee this long line for crappy conference you know Santa Clara Conference Center coffee I see this guy who looks just like the one picture we have of why from the internet so what I did is I loaded up I had my laptop with me got out my entire laptop uh, loaded up this picture from Wikipedia of why the lucky stiff and had that full screen on my laptop and I just walked up to him in line for coffee stood next to him and held out my laptop so I'm like shoulder to shoulder with him and held out my laptop with this picture of why the lucky stiff didn't say anything and he looks up from uh, you know maybe from his phone I don't know looks up and sees this thing on the laptop and he just instantly guffaws he's like <laughs> and you know I looked over at him made brief eye contact and smiled and just walked away <laughs> and it was so fun. And then, of course, you know, I had the great pleasure of spreading the rumor now that why the lucky stiff was at PyCon, and after leaving the Ruby community, he came over to Python. Same with Zed Shaw. Uh, Zed had a famous flame out from the Ruby community, famous at the time, you know, wrote some rant or something. Um, and then a couple weeks later, I think it was a couple weeks later, he showed up at PyCon. But that was a Chicago one. That was a Chicago one because Bob Brewer and I um, had rooms together pie. and we were, we had a, we threw a party and Zed showed up. We didn't think anybody would show up at this party because it was like a mile and a half from the conference center and it was across this river and through the woods and so we like over invited people to this party because we were like nobody's going to, you know, go to this other you know, hotel so far away from the, the convention center. And so we invited way too many people and everybody showed up and we just had, we had a really good time. But Zed was there. Zed like showed up at the door. I didn't really know who he was. I'm like, hey, come on in. Like, who are you? What do you do? He's like, yeah, I wrote this book by HTTP, you know, and like did some stuff in Ruby and whatever. Um, I don't know. So it's interesting. A couple anecdotes there of folks from other communities that uh, Ruby in particular here. Um, that came over to check out Python because Python is something special. You know, the Python community is great. Python 2.7, um, you know, to me is going to be in museums as just a great, great language. <laughs> sort of like the, the, the cream of the crop of that, like PHP, Ruby, JavaScript, you know, those, that generation of languages. Um, Python, you know, Python 2 in particular, I'm convinced, is going to stay at the test of time. Um, it'll always have a special place in our hearts, and uh, but it was awesome, and a great community um, along with it. <laughs> so I, I, I was there for the Zed Shaw story. What he didn't say was, we closed on the party, and I gave Zed... And I gave Zed Shaw a hard time that night as well for like, why are you such a jerk? <laughs> but he wasn't a jerk. He was a real guy. He just, one of those people was maybe less than friendly online sometimes. It's, it's okay. All right. Some of you may know this voice. Uh, so let me move this over to the screen. Here we go. Uh, the creator of SQL, well, creator and maintainer of SQL Alchemy, Mike Bayer. Uh, if who's, who uses SQL Alchemy in the room? Yeah, a lot of people. So I, I managed to twist his arm. He's like, ah, oh, I'm not feeling very creative, but for you, Calvin, I'll put something together. And this is what he gave us. Yes, this is your life. Oh my God, oh my God. We're gonna have a walk down memory lane. OMG, OMG! All right, first off, Python 2. Do you remember this voice? Hi, Python 2. Remember me? I could make a data attribute dynamic, but it was really ugly. Hmm, I know that voice. It descriptors before we had decorators up until Python 2.4, Pep 318. Wow! Are you? Without the decorator syntax, 
we had to run all of our functions into the property function directly inside the class body. Ugly! Ha ha ha, yeah. Wow, it's been so long. How have you been? Well, you know, pretty mellow. Not much to do ever since Decorator came in. Oh, hi everyone, I'm Decorator. <laughs> Decorator gave us a nice way to group functions into transformation functions, and it's hard to remember time when Python didn't have them. Wow, amazing, amazing. Okay, next up, Python 2. Do you remember this voice? Hi, Python 2. Remember me? Back when folks wanted to do something when an exception wasn't raised, boy, did they have to work really hard. Oh, dude, it's try accept and try finally can't be combined up until Python 2.5 pep 341. Wow! <laughs> While Python 2 had try accept and try finally, it didn't know how those could be safely combined into one block. So you had to make two blocks all the time. Wow, whatever happened to you, man? Well, eventually, Python does drop that finally wasn't so terrible, and then I got replaced by PEP341. Ah, oh, PEP341. <laughs> hey, I'm PEP341. With PEP341, the incredibly common task of using accept and finally at the same time no longer needed two separate try blocks. Huh. Well, who else we got? Hmm. Do -do -do. Hi, Python 2. Remember me? I used to leave files and database connections open all over the place, and nobody knew if we should use Dell or what to clean them up. And forget about it, if any exceptions were raised, resources just leaked like an old faucet. Ha ha. Oh, uh, I of course I know who you are. You are no contact managers. Bah, no context managers. Woohoo. What's up? It's no contact managers. Yeah, here I am. Before Python 2.5, nobody knew the best way to close handles. And if something fell in the middle, forget about it. Me and try accept and try finally can't be combined. Had you all going crazy. It was the bomb. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, sure was, man. <laughs> okay, knuckleheads. Get lost. Ah, oh, PEP 343. Mm, it's hard to overstate how important context managers are. The one true pattern for blocks where you need to use some resource, do some other thing, then clean up whether or not there was an error. Yeah, yeah. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Well, Python 2, this has been your life. Say hello to your current friends. Floor division by default makes no sense. And Unicode encoding <laughs> error. Hey, what's up everyone? Thanks so much for coming. Floor division by default makes no sense in Unicode encoding error. Good to know some things never change. <laughs> ha Actually <laughs> I can't imagine him on a non on a creative day. Uh, if if that was non creative. That was Oh, that one did bring a tear to my eyes when I saw it. It's very good. Okay, so the last and final one from the community. I will bring this over. Uh, you may recognize the poster on the wall, and you may recognize two of the actors from this uh, little skit. We have Paul Everett, the, uh, one of the founders of Zope Corporation and brought Zope Framework to the uh, masses. And behind the door is the creator of the Pyramid Framework, Chris McDonough. Uh, I'll let this one speak for itself. I think it's pretty darn funny. Hey, Chris, Python 2's retired. It's time for Python 3. Come on out. What do you mean? No, it's really time. Calvin wants to. I don't care about any of this. It's for Calvin. Calvin. <laughs> I'm not doing this, Paul. You know I'm not doing this. We've talked about this before. <laughs> So I want to thank them for being good sports, joining us at IndyPy. Uh, these were all original creations just for our community. They'll be put online and, and, and attributed to IndyPy for dragging these creations out of their various creators.